So we gave a quick summary of these yesterday, a little bit. So master boot record infecting rootkits are more simply known as bootkits. And so this, uh, what we would call bootkit investigation began around 2005 with uh, EI boot root. And shout outs go here to our own Scott Tenaglia, who is apparently, so he apparently did a port of their assembly between one assembler format, uh, MASM, which is what they use by default over to NASM. So if you ever meet him, you can be like, man, you're neat, man. They were giving you shout outs in the first bootkit. Man, you're not worthy. All right, so boot root and then uh, eventually the boot kit and stone boot kit, 2009. Um, but it's worth mentioning, like for instance, this stone boot kit, he was uh, really calling back to an early virus called the stone virus. Uh, and that actually infected the master boot record as well. And so early viruses would infect master boot record in order to propagate between systems. So this was sort of a known technique from viruses from back in the day but it was adapted for use in uh, root kits in order to hook into the system and change it and hide themselves and stuff like that. All right, so what does an MBR actually look like? To make things concrete, I wanted to show an example of this. And uh, this is a pretty good site that really digs down into the master boot records for the various operating systems. And so this is what the literal hex dump of a master boot record would look like. All this stuff in green, that's all actually 16-bit real mode assembly code. So I believe, yeah, so he has the disassembly down here. So 33C0, XOR, AX, AX, blah, blah, blah. So 33C0, right? So this is all just assembly code at this point. And the point here is when you're booting up the system, the BIOS, when it's done doing whatever it's going to do, when the BIOS is finally done and it wants to start kicking off the boot of the system, it reads the first sector of the hard drive, you know, sector zero, track zero, ring zero, whatever, cylinder zero. It reads the first sector of the hard drive. Oh, yeah, there it is. Cylinder zero, head zero, okay, sector one, whatever. Reads the first sector, puts it into memory, and jumps to the first uh, byte of it, which is where it's going to find a 16-bit instruction. And so these are all... 16-bit instructions. And the master boot record then is in charge of uh, pulling in the next stage of things, which would be the partition boot record. So first it has to figure out which partition is currently active, which partition is going to boot. And so to that end, there's some information right here. Uh, each of these things, 16-bit uh, lo bytes long, is actually a partition uh, information. So that's specifies data for one partition. This specifies data for another partition. That specifies data for another. So there's kind of uh, four potential partition information. And then there's just sort of a signature here at the end. So I haven't ever looked at this to see how well this specifies it. I don't think it's particularly yeah, not particularly enlightening. I like the description in uh, in your book. So go to page go to page three eighty three in your book. Specifically, you're looking at uh, six dash three, uh, table six dash three. So that's showing, you know, up in 6-18 above it, you can see there's uh, there's some information. There's a black 00, zero and then it's uh, 0, 0, 1, 0. This is on the line uh, that ends, uh, that begins with 1B0. So at the very end of that line, you see 00, zero in black and then 0, zero, zero 001. Starting at the 0, zero, zero 001, those are each of those 16 byte. Uh, partition information. So then he parses it out down in table 6-3. And to me, the only part I've been using recently that was useful to me is the, the first bit is the boot indicator bit. So if the most significant bit of one of these entries is 1, meaning that the byte looks like hex 80, 
then that means this is the partition that's active right now. So you can see up here, this one has the first partition active because it starts with 8.0, things like that. So the problem is I've been getting stuck where, you know, my master boot record, I have to like redo my master boot record. So if you boot Windows from a recovery CD, for instance, and you issue the uh, fix MBR command, issue fix MBR command, what it's going to do is it's actually going to write this information right there to the master boot record. It's just going to like slap that information over it. So if there were a boot kit right there, you would have just wiped it out. But in my case, the issue is I'm installing something like Grub right there so I can boot Linux, but then uh, it doesn't like Grub and so it won't boot Windows. So then I try to revert back to the Windows one, so I slap it over here. But the problem is Linux is still set to like some other partition is active, so I can't actually boot Windows because Windows' master boot record goes down, consults the partition information, and says, aha, I can see that partition 2 is where you want to go. And then it jumps to, you know, it parses the rest of this to find, um, you know, the sector start for the partition headers and all this sort of thing. Uh, and then it tries to load it and it fails miserably. So hex editing your master boot record for the win. You can, you know, go down and toggle which uh, partitions are active if you're in a multi-boot setup. All right, so so that's what you know. Concretely, this that was what a uh, master boot record looks like. It's a bunch of code right here. When an attacker installs a boot kit, they're changing that green code in order to basically put in the, the common technique is to put in an IDT hook actually. So they're changing that code, puts in an IDT hook where it the IDT is set up in a certain way by the um, BIOS before it transfers control, and so then this is setting it up and saying. You know, I want to find out whenever any of these, uh, whenever any data is being read from disk. So it's going to see when data is being read from disk, and then it's going to search for particular byte strings, and it's going to put an inline hook or something else uh, into any new code that's loading. So the way things work is that um, your BIOS kicks off to the master boot record. It reads in that first sector. It runs that green assembly code, 16-bit real mode assembly code. <coughs> master boot record, then, its job is to go down. And, you know, it's a very small code, right? So it can't do that much. Its job is really to go down, parse that last little table of four entries, and say which partition is active right now. And for whatever partition is active, it parses it, finds the sector information where it can find the partition bootloader, or sometimes called volume bootloader. And so it pulls that code in from whatever sector is specified in that little table at the end, pulls that information in, and then you know jumps to that code and lets that start running. And so we could start you know parsing out what the partition bootloaders look like and stuff like that. So that's why, for instance, uh, when you're installing Grub, it actually has an option. It says, do you want to install me to the master boot record, or do you want to install me to the partition boot record? Because Maybe you want to leave your master boot record the same so you can boot Windows normally, uh, but then you want to, or other times you want to put Linux, you want to put uh, Grub right here so that it can boot Windows and it can boot Linux, and it all just depends on some foibles of where Windows wants to be uh, in terms of assumptions on the hard drive. So, anyways, you know the the yeah that's where the boot kit is. He's getting in at this level, at the master boot record level. The boot kit is there. And because of that, like I said, his first job is just to read in that partition bootloader. And then the partition bootloader's job is to pull in this other part, the NT loader or boot manager, stuff like that, which loads in OS loader. I think actually those two, the OS loader and the NT loader, I think those are kind of appended together. But but you can see that at some point, you know, the, the NT loader has to transition from real mode to protected mode. And then once you're in protected mode, the OS loader gets ready. It loads up wind load, and that thing then loads in the Windows kernel. So at each of these stages, each of them is passing along to the next <coughs> stage. But the boot kit is in there early enough that it says, I want to make sure that I change things to my advantage at each stage. And so in the early stages, changing it to its advantage means hooking the IDT so that it can find out when the partition is loaded or when NT loader is loaded, so that it can, uh, once it finds, I'm, unfortunately I don't remember exactly where this happens, but let's say that 
when this goes from real mode to protected mode, yeah, I think that's a good description. But you go from real mode to protected mode, uh, the interrupt descriptor table entries are going to start being treated differently. So no longer is going to be the case that your IDT entry is going to call you back every time that you have data being read in from disk. So this is sort of an issue where the attacker needs to, the attacker had control at this stage. He, he found out every time data was being read in from disk, he could search for signatures, for instance. But when this stage goes to that stage, he would lose control. Probably going to have to hit this later and fix it. But this stage to that stage, he's going to lose control. So what he does is, at this stage, when it reads in this stage and gets ready to execute it, right? So this thing has read in the OS loader. It's ready to jump to it. Before it allows it to jump to that, the attacker puts in an inline hook here so that he can be placed at whatever code is responsible for reading in the next stage. So that now he can still see when stuff is being loaded in. Because ultimately, his goal is, at such time as the NT kernel is loaded into memory, he needs to be sitting there waiting and having control so that he can say, you know, search the NT kernel and then find something like, you know, the code which enables uh, the requirement of Windows Vista to sign kernel drivers. And he says, I don't want this thing to require me to sign kernel drivers in the future. I want to just drop a kernel driver on the system and run it. And so he can scribble that out. You know, he can put no ops over the initialization. He can make functions return immediately. He can do anything, right? Because when you overwrite code, you can do anything. And so he overwrites code in the kernel before he allows the kernel to start. Same thing if you want to get rid of patch guard, for instance, right? So in the, some of these proof of concept things, some of their payloads were, I'm going to turn off signed drivers and I'm going to turn off patch guard. So there was like a simple one that I saw recently where at the actual, I think at the OS loader level, there was something which uh, would call initialization function in order to turn on patch guard. And they found that if they just turn that to return immediately, then patch guard never gets initialized. It's never, you know, checking if anyone's putting inline hooks in the kernel. It's never checking if someone's changing the SSD key or anything else. And, you know, you think because patch guard is you know, protecting the system that it's all good, but the system has been subverted before it even started, essentially. So that's sort of uh, the basics of bootkit, right? So that's where the attacker gets early enough in the stage that he can hop his way along through each of the stages to maintain control so that he still has control by the time the kernel proper starts. All right, so <clears throat> just talking a little bit about the history here. The original EI boot root is still available. Problem is this gets flagged by our antivirus. Otherwise, I would have uh, tested, shown this as a simple test because the other ones haven't been working for me. Uh, and so this was actually, so this was the first proof of concept where they were specifically targeting kind of rootkit-like behavior. Uh, it actually, yep. So first of all, it didn't actually install to the hard drive. So it didn't like overwrite your master boot record on your hard drive proper. Instead, they had a boot CD where you put in the CD, you boot off the CD. And what does it mean to boot off the CD? It means that at the BIOS level, you've set some configuration that tells the BIOS, rather than reading from hard drive sector zero, I need to read from the CD <coughs> sector zero, right? So the BIOS now passes control to the CD. The CD has its own, you know, quote, compromised master boot record or hijacking master boot record. And what that does then is it's sort of, uh, it's just a little off to the side kind of thing. So can we go to the board? Whereas normally, so in this case, you're booting off a CD. It's going to the CD master boot record. It's executing some code. Normally, that CD master boot record would, you know, call uh, the relevant code to start up, you know, Linux on the CD, something like that. But instead, in this case, the CD master boot record goes and reads from sector zero of the hard drive where it knows the real master boot record is. And it hooks that the same way you would if you were actually installing it directly to the system. So 
it makes changes to that, and then it executes that actually. So it kicks that off, and then that just does the normal thing. That kicks off, we'll say, the volume boot record. Kicks off, dot, dot, dot. Eventually, it loads up NT, but actually EI boot root, for its actual payload and its demonstration capability, it's installing a sort of backdoor listener, something that listens on the network, and when you send it a magic packet, then it executes certain code to show that it's there. And so actually, what it then does is it hooks in ndis.sys. So if I were able to display my screen of my laptop over the thing, I would show this. You would see actually one specific inline hook in ndis.sys when I boot from this CD. Like, there's nothing else changed. I could go to a clean system, boot from the CD, it would walk its way through, and then eventually the only change is single ndis change. In order to get to the MDR, does it have to load some describers or something like that? Like, how does it know the address of the MDR and get there? Well, so that's kind of um, that's kind of the nice thing at these early stages. And unfortunately, I don't know this by memory yet until I start playing with this. But it's kind of the same reason why the master boot record in these early stages with the with the interrupt descriptor table set up the way it is. In the early stages, you're basically just calling a specific interrupt and you're giving it things saying like, I want to speak out on this particular channel where the channel can be something like this is the CD, you know, an ATA interface, a TAPI interface, whatever. So you're just kind of saying, I want to speak out on this channel and I want this sector and this sort of thing. So at the early stage, the hard drive access is actually extremely simple. And for the same reason, this guy can read in this by just giving a simple interrupt command. Uh, that's the same reason why this can, can read these. So it's, it's a function of it being in real mode. Being what? And it's the function of it being in real mode. So like everything is... Basically, yeah. It's in real mode stuff is much more simple. That's why, you know, back in the day with DOS, you know, anyone could write memory anywhere. They could change interrupts. And then therefore they could... That's kind of, you know, how viruses would, would, would work back then. They could change the interrupts, intercept file access, and then infect things on the fly, stuff like that. So it is kind of a function of it being in real mode, which, as we said, at some point you come out of real mode into protected mode. At that point, the uh, interrupts are working differently. All right, so that was EI boot root, and its payload was really just a backdoor in uh, the network component, which I wait for a magic packet. All right, so then there was vBootKit. This is actually the thing which coined the term bootkit. Which is good, so we don't always have to say MBR rootkit. Um, and so vBootkit, the V came from the fact that it was the first thing that supported Vista. So there are different, you know, um, there are different master boot records for Windows uh, XP versus Vista. So that's not so much the hard part, but the point here was to make the appropriate payloads where their proof of concept here, I believe, was uh, turning up. It was, the point was to say, look, I'm loading code on Vista despite the fact that you have a requirement of signed kernel drivers, right? So I'm bootstrapping my way into the kernel. I can do whatever I want. I think their payload here was the sort of foo uh, decom token elevation privilege. So periodically it basically just walks through the process list, finds anything that's command.exe, and elevates the privileges of all command.exe's to system. So if you boot from a vbootkit's a rootkitted system, your command.exe always turns, you know, it functionally becomes root all the time. So that was vBootKit, and vBootKit 2 was then the first thing which supported uh, Windows 7, but also x64 uh, mode. So then its payload was disabling signed drivers, disabling uh, kernel patch protection, and still having like that capability to elevate processes and stuff like that. So those were interesting uh, proof of concept things. I think vBootKit actually did work on 2000. XP and Vista or something like that. So it did support other ones, but it was the first <laughs> thing to support Vista. All right, and then Stone Bootkit was 2009, so it was kind of 2005, 2007, 2009. So Stone was, you know, in my opinion, it's kind of a weaponized uh, bootkit. It basically, he took these previous proof of concept things that, that uh, vBootkit and e, EI uh, boot root. He took them and he made it much more modular so that you could basically plug in assembly modules to have whatever payloads you want for when it finally gets into the kernel or, uh, like I said, so I could bypass TrueCrypt because, um, let's go back over the board. 
like I said, I hypothesize, I haven't looked it up. I hypothesize TrueCrypt is either putting in its own custom master boot record or putting in uh, a volume boot record. I would guess it's here because you can put much more code, but if it's not, this code here would still really just be bootstrapping some eventual thing. And so the issue was, I was, I was talking about how by hooking the interrupts, it can see when this is read in. It can search for strings if it needs to do things. But, but the point is, there's that, that cut partition where at some point, you know, protected mode versus, uh, or protected mode, protected mode versus real mode. At some point, it's going to lose control when it, you know, just based, it has control based on hooking the interrupts. At some point, it's going to lose that control. So it's wanting to read data as it's coming in so that whatever's on this side of the barrier, it writes inline hooks into that so it still has control, so it still has code executing when you jump over into protected mode, right? The problem is when you have things that are doing stuff like uh, full disk encryption, if, if this thing is transparently decrypting data as it's coming off the disk, even on this side of the thing, on this side of the uh, cut line, when it's seeing data read in, the data coming back from the interrupt is encrypted data, right? It's still encrypted. It's only when TrueCrypt handles the interrupt that it, when TrueCrypt is given the data that it decrypts it and then, you know, does whatever next. So really, if we say, I don't know how I'm going to draw this. You've got encrypted line here and you've got a decrypted line. So you get an interrupt and you're still on the encrypted side of the line. And then there's going to be some true crypt, side, true crypt code. And then that's going to put you over to the other side of the line, right? True crypt is going to be what decrypts it. Therefore, really, the attacker needs to be right here and they need to put themselves there so that they can see eventually get themselves onto the other side of this partition as well. So, so this thing also included modules to deal with that. And I would expect a similar methodology would work on most things. I say that, but for instance, I believe he had said that on stuff like uh, BitLocker, so Microsoft's full disk encryption thing, because BitLocker is actually making use of the trusted platform module, which we'll talk about in a little bit here, uh, because they're using the TPM, it actually, BitLocker would be doing verification where it's saying, you know, does everything back here look good before I'm even allowed to use my decryption key? So they, BitLocker won't even get to use its decryption encryption key first looks good. So we'll talk about that in a second. So things like BitLocker would be de defeating this, but that's because it's more like things like TPM can defeat this. All right, but anyways, Stone Boot Kit had uh, various interesting payloads. All right, so in terms of stuff that's actually in the wild for boot kits, so those were all the proof of concept, you know, make a talk at a security conference kind of things. Uh, I just pointed out that this link from the Gmer side had a good dissection of the uh, first master boot record thing from the wild, it's this web root, and also called other things and associated with or pig or sign a wall uh, botnet. So I believe the Trojan slash botnet was or pig sign a wall and the web root was the thing which was brought along with it to hide them. So this, this uh, I just want to show this quick. This analysis at uh, the Gmer site, it shows how this first thing which was in the wild was actually pretty much the EI boot root code, just modified slightly. So someone took that, said, hey, that looks like a good idea, and then started using that. So on this side is the original EI boot root code, and it's got its, you know, 16-bit assembly. And then on this side is the uh, MEB root code. So all of that looks the same, all that looks the same until the only thing different here is this uh, clear direction flag that they put in there. But then we go down here. That's the same. Move, DS, BX, et cetera. All right. So this is a little different. This uses a deck. This uses a uh, move and a sub. And move, sub, and a load S. 
But really, like, huge swaths of this code are basically all the same. So that's like, a bunch of that's really all the same. So that was just a, that's a, a little analysis of thing in the wild. Also, TDSS, or TDL3. Um, I think this link, maybe I'm not, I don't, maybe not. Uh, TDSS was the first thing in the wild that actually was able to infect 64-bit systems. So it's sort of like vBoot Kit 2. It supports x64 systems. And, you know, that's relevant because other root kits, if you don't start at these early stages, you can't just load your normal root kit on something that requires patch, that has patch guard turned on and signed code, signed kernel drivers turned on, right? Well, maybe you can sign your thing with something, steal a, steal a certificate like Stuxnet, but, um, but you can't then hook into things, right? Well, of course, then Stuxnet got around that by doing IRP hooking, which is something PatchGuard was not looking for. And actually, the funny thing here is that in both of these cases, these in the wild things, they do sort of end up using IRP hooking. So although they're potentially using a you know, good method of subverting the system very early on and keeping control, ultimately, when they get into the system, what are they doing? They're just doing the same old IRP hooking. So we already know where to look for IRP hooking, right? Just run things like uh, virus block ADA tool, uh, Gmer, and you can go see what's actually either you know, what's being called for the master uh, for the major functions or what's in the chain that maybe isn't in the chain on the next machine over. So those are the in the wild examples of boot kits. All right, so there is uh, this master boot record detecting. So there is this specific version of Gmer standalone ap application which will search for master boot record infections. Um, but I'm pretty sure that Gmer has that uh, built in right now. I'm not 100% sure because I wasn't able to get any of those proof of concept code to actually run inside my VM. So, but uh, Trend Micro actually has pretty decent, uh, their rootkit buster thing has decent removal capability. It's not on the order of uh, virus block 8 or anything because they're erring on the side of only remove stuff that we really know is bad. But, uh, but that at least claims to have uh, MBR uh, rollback essentially to those clean versions, right? And theoretically, it should be pretty easy, right? I said there's, you know, this is the Windows XP master boot record. This is the Vista one. You know, they're on those boot CDs when you boot off of them and and uh, do the fix MDR command. I should probably put detecting slash prevention and add the fix MDR command here. Because when you boot it off the CD, the attacker is not necessarily uh, able to intercept your writes and see that it's being overwritten. But then the other way to go about things is to use the TPM and start using systems that have trusted boot. So this is not a true. Um, this is not a full trusted boot system, but uh, Corey Kallenberg uh, whipped together some code which can actually go out and inspect uh, the program con platform configuration registers from the TPM, which are basically uh, registers that hold measurements. So I need to go to the board quick and, and describe some TPM stuff. So. So the TPM is a separate chip out on your motherboard somewhere, I think. Is it LPC bus? Uh, TPM is a spe uh, separate chip outside of your CPU or anything else. And it has some basic crypto capability. It has some basic storage capability. Uh, the key thing that you like about it is the fact that it has uh, key generation capability where it can generate a private key, public key pair. But it can keep the private key in this little microprocessor out to the side and never export it through any software. I mean, there's no command which you can give to a TPM to give it to give up its private key. 
it keeps the private key and it has the requisite circuitry in order to do things like digital signatures through RSA or something like that. But for purposes of trusted boot, the interesting thing here is the platform configuration registers. So you've got some of PCRs. Those are registers like any other register. They're uh, volatile memory. They get reset on the boot. But when we have a trusted boot system, so you kind of get the initial part of trusted boot for free just by turning on your TPM. So if you go into your BIOS, you turn on your TPM, uh, it'll automatically enable some code in the BIOS, which is called the uh, core root of trust for measurement. Core root of trust for measurement. So there's a little subcomponent of the BIOS called core root of trust for measurement. Just by turning on the TPM, that enables this core root of trust for measurement. And what that code does is that code is aware of the existence of TPM. It knows how to speak directly to the TPM. And what it does is it basically measures this stuff and hashes it. So hash all of this thing, the core of trust plus the BIOS. Yeah, I think it may be hashed with these separate. I can't remember. Corey, uh, ping in on the chat if I'm misdescribing this. Yeah, I'll say that it's doing those separately. So it first hashes the core of trust for measurement, and it takes that and it puts a SHA-1 into there. What does a SHA-1 on <coughs> this data right there puts it into platform configuration register of zero. Then it does a SHA-1 of that and it puts it into there. In reality, okay, I should, uh, all right, I'll be meticulous about this. In reality, the way that putting values, so you don't actually just write into these PCRs because if I could just write into these PCRs, then any attacker could go in there and uh, put any value he'd like in there. So instead, when the TPM gets reset, the PCR has the value zero in it. And what you do is you take a SHA-1 of this, and there's this operation called extend, and that's how you actually write into a PCR. And what it does is it says the new value for PCR zero prime equals SHA-1 of whatever you want. This is a variable, and here we're going to say this is the uh, one of four root of trust for measurement concatenated. So this is a concatenation sign here. Concatenated with the current PCR zero value. So Whatever is already in PCR zero, which at time of reboot is going to be zero. This is going to be zero. This is going to be something. Concatenate those together. Take SHA-1 and put that into the PCR zero. And so you can see that the reason why this is preventing an attacker from just coming in and writing any value they want to the PCR zero afterwards is because if the attacker wants to change PCR zero, he has to do this calculation again. He says extend it. It does a SHA-1. And this is the attacker has to calculate something concatenated with the current PCR zero, where when you SHA all of that, that would be equal to the value that he wants in there. And we know that from cryptographic hashes there, I don't know, Carl, you'll correct me on this if I'm wrong. There, I'm at this, because he's always correcting people. Um, not I think this is pre-image resistance. So it's saying if you have some value here that you want, pre-image resistance says that it's computationally infeasible to figure out what the value should be that you must hash in order to get uh, the desired value. All right. No corrections on the line. So anyways, when you turn on trust, so just by turning on your TPM, automatically kick off the CRTM. That, that measures itself, puts it there. It just says the BIOS puts it there. Uh, then, so it measures itself before it allows any of the BIOS code to run. 
measures the BIOS before it allows any of the BIOS code to run. After having measured the BIOS, then it transfers control. Which we're going to put as a red thing here. Then it transfers to control to uh, some other code in the BIOS. That code runs, does all the major stuff in the BIOS. But a part of that is that that is going to, uh, before it allows the master boot record to run, it's going to again do a SHA-1 of it and then extend that into some other register. So it's going to the BIOS, like we said, the BIOS when it's done, it reads the master boot record up into memory and normally it would just jump directly to it. But when you have your TPM turned on, it hashes it, you know, it doesn't extend into some specific PCR, so you get a hash of what that master boot records, you know, data was. That gets put into the PCR and then it transfers control to the master boot record. Now unfortunately this is the point at which the TPM aware code is done. So at this point if you want to extend the system further you have to have TPM aware master boot record which measures this before it control, transfers control. And then this has to measure the next thing before it transfers control. And that's how you can get an unbroken chain. But even just turning on the TPM you automatically get measurements up through the master boot record. And that means if someone changes your master boot record you would see a change in the hashes which get put into the PCRs. So Corey threw together some uh, code which all it does is it goes out and says, Dear TPM, tell me what your PCRs are. So this is not a trusted boot in the sense that you would like those values to be signed by a key that you know is associated. So you'd like to have a public key associated with a private key. A private key would be held forever in the TPM and you'd say, Dear TPM, sign those PCRs with your private key and then you would take the public key to verify the signature and say, yeah, that really came from that TPM. But this just says, goes out and says, you know, at least let me see what the values are in my PCR. Because if I went across all of these machines right now, if I'm getting different hashes for the master boot records in here, then there's something up. So nice and uh, easy here. Uh, he created something called inspector. And yeah, like he's, okay, so he clarified the reason. This is in his transfer folder and there's a password on it. It's, I have the power 111. So if you want to grab this from Corey Kallenberg's transfer folder, password is I have the power 111. That's password on the zip file in his transfer folder. And that's only because this inst driver.exe actually, I don't know, Corey, I I ran this and Symantec didn't complain about it. I'm going to disable Symantec just in case, but, uh, but sometimes it says this inst driver, which all it does is it loads up this TPM driver. But like I said, from rootkit.com, so it must be bad. So run.bat will load up this inst, uh, will run inst driver, which will load the TPM driver, which will talk to the TPM and say, please tell me what's in your PCRs right now. So I run that, loads it up, and these are the values in the PCRs right now. So a couple of interesting things worth noting here. So we see these values multiple times, there and there. So there's just copies of the same thing. Overall, we only have, seem to have four unique values here. So there's this zeroth one, which I said I believe is the core root of trust. Got this one, two, and three, which I think is the BIOS. Uh, four, which I think is the configuration of the BIOS, so it can actually tell you if someone goes in, so I believe that's the NVRAM, so it's, you know, the non-volatile RAM, but it's only non-volatile as long as you have a battery plugged into your machine, right? So it's got the little, tiny little battery that keeps the NVRAM having uh, electricity so that it can keep your BIOS configuration, and that holds the stuff like if you're booting from CD or you're booting from diff. So if someone goes into your BIOS, changes it so that the CD boots before the hard drive, you can detect that because that'll be a change in there. All right, and then I believe this one right here, five, is the master boot records hash. So basically now if we ran this across all the machines and if we were seeing this five was different across things, then we'd be suspicious that something has a different master boot record. We'd want to go inspect further. So this is at least uh, an initial cut of a way that you can uh, be checking MBR across systems. Because this hash is taken, before the master boot record gets control. So if you have a boot kit installed, this hash is taken, it's put into the TPM, 
before the master boot record runs. So that even, you know, you put this hash in there, the attacker could run and they could try to change the PCR if they want. But the problem is that pre-image resistance. They could try to extend something to PCR5, but they need to find out what this question, question, question is. So that SHA of that value plus, you know, concatenated with SHA of something else when hash equals, you know, this, well, equals this value. Uh, equals some good value, I guess, mixing things up here. Pretending that the attacker was installed there. All right. So that's one way you can go about uh, detecting uh, master boot record infecting boot kits. All right. And so I guess I had this slide, which is just kind of talking about what I just talked about, where you start at the hardware at time zero when you reboot your machine. PCRs all get either set to zero or F. So we saw that in some of these things. Some of these have zero by default. All these ones up here have zero by default. And some of these higher ones have F by default. Doesn't really matter. But they all get set back to default states at time zero. Then the core root of trust for measurement gets kicked off. That's right here. And it says, it measures itself in the BIOS and it puts those into PCR0. Then it can transfers control to the BIOS where the BIOS measures option ROMs like I was just talking about, PCI expansion ROMs, uh, anything that's sort of a, a little plug-in for the BIOS to initialize, you know, PCI cards and things like that. And then it uh, appends the measurements of the option ROMs plus the BIOS to uh, PCR1. Now, I should say that these right here, these say what's supposed to happen per the spec. Don't, you know, take this with a grain of salt. I don't think uh, this is necessarily exactly accurate. Second, this thing called the OS loader, this is actually just the um, master boot record. So it's only measuring the master boot record, putting it in one of the PCRs. And then it says, you know, passing control to the OS. Well, we know that there's this breakpoint here where the master boot record passes to volume boot record, passes to NT loader passes to OS loader, passes to win load, blah, blah, blah. All of those phases pass the master boot record. In order to get this chain to continue, you would have to have TPM aware things. So I said in the, in the BitLocker case, um, over to the board. I don't even know exactly where it is, but So BitLocker is over here somewhere. It's doing this transparent encryption decryption of things. But because BitLocker is TPM aware, it uses a different capability to TPM called, oh, what's it called again, where you lock in a key to the TPM? Anyone? 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 No? People on the thing? No, it's when the PCRs have to be, so at the seal and unseal. There we go. Yes. Okay. Sealing and unsealing. There's this notion of the TPM where you can seal some data into non-volatile storage in the TPM. And you're sealing it under the assumption that you're saying, I, dear TPM, please store this data for me. And I want you to only ever release this data to me if the PCRs are in the same state that they're in right now when I'm sealing. So I can only ever unseal the data if the PCRs are in the same state. So when BitLocker comes along, when BitLocker initializes, you run BitLocker, you start it up. All of this stuff is uh, on, on a BitLocker system. It has to, you know, do measurements of things like this as well. It adds in potentially a volume bat, uh, boot record measurement, stuff like that. So the point is when BitLocker comes along and says, I'm going to start encrypting your hard drive, um, it knows at this state that there's a measured boot right now. And it says, I'm going to just assume that that's good. Whatever this is, I'm going to assume it's good. And that's what I expect in the future. Otherwise, I'm not going to uh, decrypt your hard drive. So it assumes this is all good. In that, it says, take whatever's in those PCRs right now. Here's my key for doing hard drive encryption. I want you to store this key for hard drive encryption. And I only want you to ever give it back to me as long as these PCRs are in the same state. And for the PCRs to be in the same state, got to have the same BIOS, got to have the same master boot record, got to have the same volume boot record. All of those have to be measured to cause the same hashes to occur in the TPM. 
And if that's the case, then BitLocker can come along, issue unseal, and it can get back its key in order to do the decryption, encryption of the hard drive. So because it's requiring this certain state, now if, for instance, maybe a MBR, I, I don't know if this is true or not. Theoretically, if the master boot record infecting root kit was already installed at the time that it seals the key in, maybe it would persist. I kind of doubt it though, but, uh, but that's just to let you know that if you, for instance, enable BitLock around some clean system, you're locking yourself into that state. You know, you're not going to be able to dual boot it or anything like that. But uh, you are going to de detect any BIOS attacks or MBR attacks or anything. All right, so one last thing to talk about, and we'll take a break. So I pretty much covered, I did cover all of the rootkit type stuff that I'm going to cover in this class at this point. So all the SSDT stuff, IDT stuff, IIT stuff, up through boot kits, that's about where we're going to leave it. And so you can see we're not, you know, I originally thought I was going to be able to get into ring negative one rootkits in here, but uh, not so much. So, Again, any questions on any of the stuff we've covered uh, throughout this class so far? All right. So the last thing, this is just a miscellaneous thing. Uh, thus far, we've you know definitely been focused on you know, what does the attacker do when they get into the system to roll it back at least one level. So we're still not going to talk about you know how does the attacker get onto the system, for instance, whether they have an exploit or they you know stole someone's password or anything like that. But we will just talk a little bit about how does the attacker load kernel code, for instance, if they want to be a ring zero rootkit, right? Um, and so the main way that an attacker will do that is through the service control manager. This is the legitimate way that kernel drivers are loaded on a Windows machine. So SCM, the benefit to an attacker, the pros of it, is that is you know the official way, it's the supported way, it works, it's reliable, stuff like that. The cons of it is that when you load something through SCM, it leaves a registry footprint. So there's a registry key somewhere that says, you know, here's all the stuff, here's all the kernel modules that I want to load at start time. Or you know, here's it SEM is beyond kernel modules, it also does some user space services as well. But the key point is that when you say I want to load my kernel module, uh, at boot time or just on demand or anything like that, you'll leave a registry footprint. So that's why things like a Hacker Defender, they use SCM, they create some services, but then they also make sure that they hook registry reads and writes so that they can um, hide the fact that they have created a service, right? So leaves a registry footprint, but if you're a rootkit, the point is hide that registry key, right? And so if you go in right now and you list what's on the system using the normal tools, if you go and look at the registry, you're not going to see it. So um, I want to look at that quick just so we can see the cross compare between you know what a normal tool would see and what something like Gmer sees. So uh, in your VM, let's see. I'm going to uh, quickly take you to the quote uh, or not quote just. I'll show you where in the registry the actual service information is stored. So if you do run and pull up regedit, so go to H key local machine and then system and current control set right here. This current control set is actually just sort of an alias. It's, it's actually pointing at one of these two things above it, control set one or control set two. There's two of them because one of them is just whatever the last successful boot was, and one of them is whatever your current thing is. So it keeps kind of a, a quote, known good version so that if your system isn't working correctly, it can uh, drop back to something that doesn't load a particular kernel module, for instance. But anyways, current control set will always alias to whichever of those two is being used. So that's what you want to look at. So expand that and then expand services. And now this is sort of the exhaustive list of all of the services which are registered on the system. So for instance, right now, if I scroll down to basic, I know that this is one of the ones that I added. This is the basic call gate, I believe. So 
it's, you can see it's not trying to hide itself at all. This is one of those proof of concept ones that all it does is go in and do one specific thing. So, you know, there are many different ways to persist on the system and there's many different ways to do loading the kernel, mod, kernel code. But you can see I was very lazy with these and most of these I was quite lazy. And I just used SCM to load them as normal things under the assumption that they would look basically like just some system component to you and, and you wouldn't know exactly what's supposed to be on the system. Therefore, you wouldn't know they're not supposed to be on the system. So if I scroll over, I can see the full path to, that's where the basic kernel driver is. Uh, right here, this start field. Uh, you can Google this, but um, there's just a few different things. Actually, it's probably in the, uh, the book on that page 199. Book on page 199. I'm pretty sure this goes in order. At the bottom there, where it's saying the start parameter, there's boot, system, auto, demand, disabled, stuff like that. Pretty sure boot is one, system is two, auto is three. Things like that. So boot means start this service, which means load this kernel driver at boot time. So system's booted up, load up the kernel driver. And so these are just different levels of when they get started, essentially. So the earliest you can start is by setting something as a boot load driver. So if you set system, it would wait, it would let the kernel start doing initialization, and then it would do it. All right. So these are the things which are currently defined. Um, I'm going to just scroll down to the H's. Let's see, H, I. <coughs> All right, so here's G and here's H. So GPC and then help service. So right now I don't see Hacker Defender through this thing, but it turns out Hacker Defender is installed. It's just hooking, it's injecting itself into RegEdit. It's hooking the calls to read registry, and then it's hiding the results for that. It knows here's where my registry keys are, and then it hides them. And it can do that all from user space. So that's what RegEdit, regedit sees. All right, so what is Gmer see? Well, if I just click off everything in Gmer except registry, and then I do a scan. Actually, I, let's see, services is what I'm going to do instead. I click on services and do a scan in Gmer. Hoping this is sufficient. Yep, there it is. All right, so these are two of the things where it's saying, you know, it definitely knows that it's bad. And what it's showing right here is there's one service that's set to auto start, and it's named Hacker Defender 100. And there's one service set to manual start, and it's named Hacker Defender Driver 100. And each of those has associated with it these uh, particular, you know, this one has a driver, this one has an EXE. And those entries are in the registry right now. So those entries are in the registry, it's just you can't see them with regedit, can't see them with things like auto runs. And unfortunately, right now, you can't see them with virus block ADA. They don't have uh, good registry parsing at this point. So these would also be hidden from VBA. But, uh, but the key point is here, SCM is a big target for manipulation and for hiding things. So it's going to be the most common way that stuff's going to start up uh, kernel drivers. Uh, and if they do that, they're either A, going to try to blend in and just look like some existing component. So going back to the Stuxnet stuff, if you read through the thing, it says it just starts one of these um, services through the service control manager. So it just says, hey, I'm the MRX net service. And I think the reason why that matters is if you go right here, right, you'll see there are existing services that are legitimate Windows services for MRX dev and MRX SMB. Those are legitimate things, so when you just see another MRX net, you know, who are you to say that that's bad, especially if it's digitally signed and all that. So here's another one of our things, MS DirectX. That's a hidden, that's using DCOM to hide itself right now. That's actually the Fudo driver. It's using DCOM to hide itself. The interesting thing here actually is Fudo is loaded by user space application, foo.exe. Foo.exe just uses the programmatic way of calling Service Control Manager in order to say, all right, I want to register a service. I want to load my driver, uh, this driver right here. 
drivers ms directx.sys. I want to load my driver, but then it immediately, after it loads, it says, I want to now delete my service. The thing is, SCM, when you're doing it programmatically, it doesn't delete it out of the registry immediately. Instead, it just sets this delete flag to one, and then on the next reboot, it deletes it out of the registry. So it's actually still kicking around here, completely unhidden, uh, sitting in the registry. So looking at the registry for anything that has a delete flag set right now is, is a good idea, but you know, you're probably never going to, to catch that because that means rootkit's installed, but they just haven't rebooted yet. Now that said, if they're using something like this delete flag, they must have some other way of persisting, right? Because their driver is not going to get loaded automatically, but maybe their EXE is going to get loaded automatically elsewhere, and that EXE will again start the driver, you know, delete the service and stuff like that. How does Gmer detect the hidden registry settings? I believe, but don't quote me on this, I believe it's going to go directly to disk and parse the uh, registry files off of disk. So these things, so Hacker Defender right now is hiding things when you're calling the like ZW query key and you're calling system calls to read the registry to basically let the OS parse it for you. But I think Gmer is actually going to the registry file, parsing it and saying, you know, what does a system call show me and what does my manual parsing show me cross view detection, you can see that something's hidden. And specifically, that's why they have that services tab, is because they know that that's going to be a common target. You know, you can hide things anywhere in the registry, and you will, if you go back and run these things again, you will see stuff hidden elsewhere in the registry by Vanquish and whatever else. But services was a particular one that they focused on because they knew that if people use the legitimate SCM method of loading kernel drivers, they're going to probably want to hide their, their driver in the registry. All right, and so I'll come back to this point a little bit when I cover auto runs. I may even cover auto runs next. Um, so that was the first legitimate way. So that's the legitimate way of loading uh, kernel drivers. Now there's a couple other ways. Uh, one of them is ZW set system information. So this is something Greg Coglin found and posted to Bug Track back in 2000. Um, and this was just he was you know back in 2000 reverse engineering stuff looking for good rootkit targets. And he found with this one that there was actually a particular input you could give to this in order to specify a driver file, which would then get loaded into memory. Now, there's a caveat to this in that this driver file, which gets loaded into memory, gets loaded into paged memory. So that means it gets put into memory, but this memory can be kicked out at any time. So if you're loading a kernel driver, which is, for instance, going to put an IDT hook, you don't want that IDT to like, that IDT code which gets invoked when an interrupt occurs, you don't want that to get kicked out of memory because otherwise you're not going to be able to get it in in time and you're going to crash the system. So the attacker has to be aware that uh, their code is going to be loaded into pageable memory. But that said, if they're doing something like key for hook, key for hook, you know, automatically copies itself into non-paged memory. So they could just use the same sort of strategy. They load up through this. They get loaded into paged memory, they copy themselves in non-paged memory, and then they just, you know, unload or delete their existing memory. And so the thing here would be that, you know, this obviously does not have a registry footprint. Well, it's not obvious. This doesn't have a registry footprint. So this is just a sort of weird uh, back-end system functionality that he found and <coughs> will load up the code for you. All right, so that's one way. Another way is you can directly call ZW load driver. This is actually the kernel side function that's used by service control manager in the back end. So when service control manager loads something up, when you ask it to from user space, it's actually calling ZW load driver and eventually in the kernel that gets called. But that's really just a way if you would only go directly to ZW control driver, it still, I believe, has a registry footprint. It still requires all the same stuff that service control manager requires. I believe it's just you would use it to sort of obfuscate what you're doing to make it uh, not clear that you're importing functions for doing SCM or anything like that. And then on uh, Windows systems earlier than Vista, you could go directly to the physical memory and hack code directly into the physical memory and have it executed as long as you knew uh, where instructions would be jumping and stuff like that. But uh, that's not a particularly it's certainly a way that doesn't require registry things, but it's much more complicated and it's uh, 
more prone to crashes. And also, again, it's uh, you can't get access to. I guess the the benefit of this at the time was that you didn't need uh, elevated privileges to access slash device slash physical memory. So any you know any compromise of the user account at any privilege level, you could then get this code into the kernel, right? Which is a nice thing. But as a Vista, you need to be or running as an administrator anyways, and if you can run as an administrator, you can use other techniques that are less hackish and more stable, essentially. So these are, though, the basic